Welcome, everybody. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. Good to see you again. I missed you last week. Thanks for um, bearing with us during our week of winter. And we're back to just the gray and wet. Um, news story you probably saw a couple weeks ago. Uh, Lucy Karowski, 20 years old, in, I'm going to mess up the name of the town, De Beer, De Beer, something like that, Wisconsin. They pronounce everything different in Wisconsin anyway, so for all I know, I am right. 20 years old, it was actually her birthday that day. She had gone to get her hair done and was coming back out to her car. And for whatever reason, the news reports seemed to uh, go back and forth, whether it was the car that actually was in trouble or whether she got stuck in the snow. Apparently, it snows a lot in Wisconsin. But even by the age of 20, you have to know what you're doing. So it's not so much that Lucy... Uh, was, the, was at fault in all of this. She just was stuck. Her car was stuck. And, you know, you, when it's your birthday, you kind of want things to go right. So a car getting stuck or whatever isn't the greatest way to, um, to get going. But uh, there was a, a car beside her, and a guy coming out of some store nearby got in the car and was backing up and starting to drive away, but all of a sudden turned around and came back. And rolled down the window, got out of the car, and much to her amazement, it was this guy. Anybody guess who it was? It's Jordan Love, the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. Now, the thing you got to know about Lucy, Lucy's a Green Bay Packers fan, not just a Green Bay Packers fan, a Jordan Love super fan. <laughs> she had followed Jordan Love since he got drafted. I don't even remember when Jordan Love got drafted. I think he spent a couple years under Aaron Rodgers. But he's been high profile this year. And so she's fangirling like crazy as her idol, her hero, Jordan Love, is there asking if she's okay. And she says, I don't remember what I said, but I think I said yes. <laughs> but it was all just sort of surreal right then. As Jordan gets out of his car and they both go up to the front of her car and start trying to push it out, get it unstuck, however. And <laughs> Lucy, in a moment of clarity, recognizing that Jordan actually was surprised he was there because they were supposed to play the Dallas Cowboys in like two days. And she's like, what are you doing here? She realized that perhaps Jordan might get injured pushing her car out. And she says, we better stop. <laughs> I don't want you to get hurt and have that be on me. That would, you know, I would have to go into hiding or whatever. So... She lets him off the hook, and he's like, okay. She says she had help on the way. They got this selfie. That was, that was his, uh, his gift. And, you know, obviously his stock went up. And, of course, two days later, unless you're a Cowboys fan, his stock went way up as the Packers beat the Cowboys. Couldn't overcome the 49ers, but, you know, whatever. Justice will be served eventually. <laughs> Come on, AFC. This was a moment for her she will never forget. Did the car get unstuck? Yes. Did she need help? Yes. She wasn't going to get unstuck by herself. She knew it. And miracle of all miracles, her sports hero, Jordan Love, is the guy who shows up to offer her help. Changed her life. She'll never forget that moment. At some point, you may not have tried to get unstuck in Wisconsin, but I guarantee at some point in your life, you have found yourself stuck. Uh, I found midlife <laughs> to be an incredible time of just feeling like this is what's happening. Or you wake up to pains you didn't have the day before, or hair that used to be there that's not. <laughs> Things that, you know, maybe it's relationship. Maybe you're stuck as a single person, as a newly single person, somebody who's been dating somebody for a long time and you're like, where's this going? Or a marriage that just is, where's that going? Maybe you're parenting kids right now and they're 30 and they haven't left yet and you're like, where's this going? Maybe you're trying to help with your parents and you're not wanting to admit maybe where that's going, but you just feel stuck. You've been in whatever you're in for long enough now that you feel like nothing's moving. Maybe it's your finances. 
Maybe, you know, 2024 was supposed to be this, oh, we're going to get our budget fixed, and then the credit card statements show up, and you're like, here we go again. And nothing changes. Work hasn't changed. Your boss hasn't changed. The people you work with haven't changed. And so there's a tendency to find ourselves, even if we don't like it, don't want to admit it, wish we could do something else where we feel stuck. Am I talking to anybody? We've all been there. Spiritually, now this is one that's really uncomfortable, we can feel stuck spiritually. Maybe at one point God felt really close, and now not so much. Maybe there's a little too much life happening right now for that feeling to still be there. And you feel stuck. The, the things that used to bring you hope and inspiration and joy and peace, or whatever, those, those things aren't quite doing it for you. And sometimes we, we run to the next event, we go to the conference, we pick up the book or the music or the way, hoping that'll kind of do it for us, but it doesn't. And you feel stuck and a little disappointed. Because you look at that and you say, well, what's it going to take for me to get unstuck? I don't like being stuck. Most people don't enjoy being stuck. Sometimes it's the devil we know. But other times, we would love to get unstuck. We just don't know how. And what I'm here today to tell you is that as we keep talking through this Taking Back Your Life series, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, is you have to warm up to the notion of grace. Because taking back your life is more about leaning into God's grace than it is your grit. Of course you have energy. Of course you have willpower. Of course you have resources and a bright mind, and you can put things around you to kind of help, but at the end of the day, when we're going to talk about taking your life back in a way that really says, I was here and now I'm here, you have to cozy up to the notion that God's grace covers whatever you can't, and it covers it more than enough. And so it's not about just our doing that gets us unstuck in life. Now, for some of you, that's the price of admission because you have tried all of the things, and you wonder why you're so tired and you're still not unstuck. It's because it's not about your determination. It's not about your perseverance. Yes, those things are important. Of course they're important. It's not what comes first. It's a response to a grace that has been given to us by God through the person of Jesus that says, I got you. And that sometimes is the biggest fight. And we want to talk about that today because until we confront that notion and the way that we're supposed to respond to it, we're going to have trouble. By contrast, if we can, and we're going to see this in our story today that we're looking at in the Bible, access the faith that we have. And you say, Jason, I don't have very much. That's why I'm here. I'm running on empty fumes. But what you're going to see in this story today is the character that we're going to talk about, you could easily identify with. Could be the same as you. The big idea that we'll see as we look through this story is that rewarding faith is often risky. You want the payoff, but you're not willing to take the risk. A lot of people are risk averse in all spheres of life, but spiritually speaking, we, we tend to hesitate sometimes because there is this sort of, if I take this next step, what's going to be next? And you don't know. That's why it's called faith. If it was something else, we'd call it certainty. <laughs> but there is an unknown. But that's where the reward comes in, in God's economy. That's where the payoff comes in, is by faith stepping into the unknown with a hope, with a confidence that really defies logic and goes against our understanding sometimes because we can't see how it's all going to work out. But it's precisely what God invites us to, to get us unstuck and to take back your life. You with me? All right, let's move forward here. We want to look at a story in Mark chapter 10. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are four gospels, four accounts of the life of Jesus told by four different people. John Mark, they just dropped the John after a while, and just Mark, wrote what is arguably the first account historically. 
Matthew and Luke seem to borrow quite a bit of Mark's material. John, he kind of goes off on his own. John was there, so it's not like we discount him just because his narrative looks a little different. But Mark is the most succinct. And as he's tracking through the life of Jesus, we see uh, really Mark in two halves. Uh, the compassion of Jesus shows up in the first part. As you read through, it takes you about a half hour to read the whole book of Mark. The first half, Jesus is showing his compassion as he goes into ministry, as he's touching people, as he's teaching, as he's preaching the kingdom of heaven, as he's inviting people to repentance, he's doing miracles, he's doing all these things. And then kind of at a midway point, his focus shifts on his destination. Jesus knew that his ultimate reason for coming wasn't just to be a nice guy and to say some nice things. It was to offer his life as a sacrifice for you and for I, for the sins that we have committed, for the sins of humanity to offer his life. That is the good news. And so we, we get that from Mark, that Jesus is on a mission. His passion is to get to Jerusalem where this is all going to go down. And so in Mark chapter 10, we're kind of working through this pivot point. This is Jesus' last stop. I want to pick up the narrative here in verse 46. Jesus came to Jericho. Do you remember Jericho from the Old Testament? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho. Jer Don't make me sing the whole thing. It's terrible. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, word has gotten out this guy's something. And so he's got crowds following him. But they're leaving the city. So they've made this pass through Jericho. And a blind man named Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus. Pause real quick. This is, we've always said this is his name. Might not even been his name. That's just what people knew him as. It's Tim's boy. What? Isn't that awful? Isn't it important when you meet somebody that they kind of know your name, remember you? Everybody in town knew him as Tim's boy. They didn't know what his name was. Could have been Stu. Who knows? But they knew, everybody knew him as Bartimaeus, Tim's boy sitting by the roadside, begging. Why was he doing that? Well, it wasn't bad enough to be blind. Yes, he also couldn't work. Probably disowned by the whole community because in those days, to be blind meant that you had done something wrong. It was God's punishment on you. And so the spiral of negativity puts him by the roadside, begging in his own hometown. Let's keep reading. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, listen, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. You can read through the whole gospel of Mark and nobody else in Mark's gospel, not the crowds, not his own disciples, nobody else calls Jesus son of David. Isn't that curious? Well, why would that be? We know by this point in the story that Jesus' popularity had built because there's a whole crowd, but a crowd of who? Who were the people following him? People who were curious? People who were kind of maybe caught up in the groundswell of this grassroots guy who's doing some cool things and maybe going to overthrow Rome? Maybe they, maybe they got caught up in the inertia of that? But here's a blind guy who had only heard who had only heard about Jesus. I've never been blind, <laughs> but people who are tell me that your other, your other senses get heightened. And as a blind person on the roadside begging, you can imagine Bartimaeus probably had some downtime to stop and think, to really consider what he had heard about this person named Jesus. And at some point, he had already decided that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was the Messiah, that he was God's son, son of David. This is the term that Bartimaeus is putting out there. Above the clamor of the crowd, the shout of everybody, Bartimaeus calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's the one voice out of everybody who believes. Folks, I have good news, bad news for you. Sitting in this building this morning does not mean you are a Christian. It just doesn't. It means you're in the crowd. You're watching this morning. 
watching a church service does not make you a Christian. It makes you part of the crowd. We put this stuff on the World Wide Web. Anybody on planet Earth can watch this. That doesn't mean everybody's a Christian. It means you're part of a crowd. Now, you might be a curious crowd, and I'll take that any day. Jesus certainly wasn't like, ooh, crowds, get away from me. No, he, he, he loves people. He loves you. But as we read in the story, there was something different about Bartimaeus. He was already convinced. He wasn't just part of the crowd. I know people have questions and reservations. Show us another miracle. God, do this amazing thing, and then I'll believe. If only I had this question figured out or this problem got fixed, then I'll believe. Folks, Bartimaeus' problems were not fixed. He was still poor. He was still blind. He was still begging. And yet, he believed. Can you, in the middle of your circumstance, right now, wherever you are, in a moment of clarity, say, you know what? I know that life isn't perfect. And yet, I choose to believe in you, Jesus. I choose to look to you to have mercy on me. I am stuck. But you're walking through my town, and I'd be a fool not to call out to you. I'm sitting in this church today, and I might not even know why. But in this moment, God, I'm choosing to call out to you? Or do you just want to show up and kind of follow along and do what everybody else is doing and not be changed? The crowd had a choice that day, but Bartimaeus was the only one who was convinced and who put his faith on the line to call out to Jesus for mercy. Sometimes we worry Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go on. Lisa Harper has a quote here. Intimacy with Jesus is not found in managing your expectations, but raising them to accommodate miracles. Raising them to accommodate miracles. It's a very dangerous word in my line of work. People will oftentimes, I think, put God to the test hoping for the miracle. When I think a ventilator is a miracle. When I think all the medicines that you can put in a person's body to keep their heart beating is a miracle. The brilliant minds who come around with the EKGs and the ultrasounds and their knowledge and can look inside the human body and see what's going on, I think that's a miracle. I think sometimes death is a miracle. (laughs) Your definition of miracle doesn't, I'm not here to argue that point. What I'm saying is it's often broader than what we think. And we don't give God enough credit for what a miracle could be, for what miracle he might be working in your life. We we, we celebrate the, the things we can see all the time. It's harder to see the things happening inside or the the groundwork that Dylan was talking about a little bit ago that might be happening so that in time something may come to the surface. Bartimaeus wasn't hindered by any of these things either. He he could have sat there and believed what the crowd was telling him. Basically, stay put. And and the way the the scripture reads, it's more than just a little aggressive. Like sort of when you're driving and your kids are acting up, what do you do? You reach around the back. You just start doing this. Reaching for things you can pinch or, you know, pull this car over, I will. You know, meanwhile, the car is kind (laughs) of like that. This is what the crowd is doing, threatening him a little bit. Shut up or we're going to shut you up. You're messing up this this parade in little Jericho. Don't make us look bad, Tim's boy. If you're going to take back your life, you have a choice to make. Are you going to settle for what other people might say about you, how it might look? Are you going to lower your expectations? Well, if God could have already, he would have. And so I just have to kind of put my head down. Or are you going to call out to God all the more? 
The crowd couldn't shut Bartimaeus up. When he called out, they were trying to quiet him, but he didn't go for that. He called out all the more. It seems foolish sometimes. It seems desperate. It feels foolish in our age of got to keep it together, got to make it look a certain way. Some of you I know are bringing in a whole ton of garbage this morning. And yes, you can't spill that out to everybody, but really? Really? We're not even going to address it? The reality that you're in? And what that might require in terms of laying your self-image aside and saying, God, I need you. Nothing else is going to fix it. Nothing else is going to fix me, what's broken inside of me. Nothing else is going to move me forward in life. Whether the situations change or not, whether my circumstances change or not, what's it going to take? So what happens in the story? Let's look at verse 49 and the rest of it here. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Oh, okay, now the crowd changes. <laughs> now that Jesus is on this guy's side, then they want to be nice. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Maybe on his own, I don't know. I mean, how cruel is that? What's interesting to me, Jesus stopped. Mark has spent his whole narrative talking about how Jesus was showing compassion, but then in a moment he changes and begins his route to Jerusalem. And in the midst of that, one guy calling out for help caused him to stop. Jesus put Easter on hold for one guy. Folks, what, what do you think of yourself in the eyes of God? I... I wonder sometimes, I'm a little concerned other times, that, that Bible-believing, good-hearted Christian people are so eager for Jesus to come so that the bad people get their punishment. And I'm like, what? No, no. Jesus died for everyone. And he would move heaven and earth. He has to save one more person. Your friend, your coworker your family member, your neighbor, he would stop for them. Yes, I want him to come back too, but I'm not in such a hurry that I want others to be left behind. I don't want that. I want to be like Bartimaeus, who's willing to call out all the more, who wants to risk that little bit more just to even get close. He's not even asking for anything yet except for mercy. And he gets an audience with his Jordan love with his hero, this person that he has dreamed about in his mind's eye, one-on-one -on -one with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Folks, don't settle for less. Jesus feels that way about each and every one of you. He feels that way about me. I always worry, oh, God, you're so busy, you know, doing other things. <laughs> you don't have time for little old me. He says, really? Really? You're calling for mercy. Why would I not stop? And so he does. Let's go on to the next verse here. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Think about that for a minute, what he's asking Jesus to do. And then think about this. One word, one word from Jesus. Go. 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 Your faith has healed you. Mark says, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. There's so much there. There's so much there. Jesus asks, I mean, it should have been obvious to him, right? If I you were just in Portland, you know, homeless people in Portland, a lot of homeless people. If I walked by and somebody was, you know, calling for help, I'd be like, mm, what do you want me to do for you? Well, duh. But he asks. Why does he ask? Why does he ask? It's not because Jesus didn't know. 
It's not because Jesus couldn't see. It was obvious. It was obvious to everybody what he would have asked. It was important for Bartimaeus to make the ask. It was about him stepping up and using the faith that he had, whatever faith it was, to say, Jesus, I'm not afraid to ask you for what, humanly speaking, is impossible. I'm willing to ask you for that, even if I look like a fool, because let's face it, what else do I have to lose? I don't have anything else. You are my only hope. And that is the kind of faith that Scripture says Jesus is looking for and is about. Bartimaeus made the big ask. He asked for the impossible. With the little bit of faith that he had, the only thing he had left, he asked for a miracle to be able to see. Let me ask you, what are you afraid to ask God for? What's too big for God in your world? Now you say, well, you know, I mean, some of the things I ask God for are more just like a heavenly slot machine kind of thing, you know. Oh, I'd like a little more money, a little better job, whatever. But are you serious? I mean, what, what, would it, what would life be like for Bartimaeus if he could see? Well, if being blind was the thing that put him in this social status, then being able to see would do what? Would put him right back in community. He would be able to function. So the big ask was really just to be able to do what he could normally do. What's, what's too big for God? I was at the store the other day. We needed to pick up cat litter because we always need to pick up cat litter. Oh my gosh. And they didn't have our favorite kind of cat litter, the one that doesn't, you know, kick up much dust. They just had the other stuff that's like a cloud every time you try and, you know. I didn't want that cat litter. And they were out. And I was with my son, and I'm like, come on. We get, and I said, you know what? Mm-mm. And I did. I prayed this stupid little prayer. Lord, you don't owe me anything, but I really would not like to have to come back to Costco. <laughs> I mean, ever would be awesome, but today or tomorrow would be so great. I just need some cat litter. And I am not kidding you. I turned around, and there's a cart, an unmanned cart, with a case of the cat litter they were out of. And I looked, and there was no pallets around with that cat litter. It was right there. You cannot convince me otherwise, folks. (laughs) I'll stake my life on it. That cat litter just showed up. (laughs) And I did. I took one look around, and I went, thank you. (laughs) And I went on my way. Now, does that mean I have faith or I'm just a... Well, I'm a cat owner, so yes, I have faith. (laughs) I'm an idiot, but I have faith. I've had to pray for a lot bigger things than that. But if I can't pray for cat litter, what in the world am I going to do asking for something so huge? Don't you think Bartimaeus had prayed for some just routine, ordinary things too, and God had provided for him day by... He'd been blind a long time. God had sustained him through all of that time through his period of doubt and wondering and poverty and an affliction that he probably thought he would never regain sight from, but I bet he imagined it. And when his moment came, because he had dared to ask the little things, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. When it came time to ask for the big thing, he wasn't afraid to do it. Folks, where are you at? Where's your courage today? Are you able to ask God for what's important? He cares. It doesn't mean he's going to, you know, it's like like a genie in a lamp. He's not just going to, like, give you whatever. But why not ask? Why not ask? What's the worst he can say? The worst he can say is no. That's not a trick question. Or not yet. It doesn't mean he doesn't care that he doesn't love you. Any good parent says, no, my kids come up at age four and want to drive the car. I'm going to say no, not because I'm mean. Because I don't want to buy another car. Kid's going to crash the car two seconds in. It's, it's okay to ask for the little things and to allow God's mercy to color it, to give it context, and to be patient and to allow things to work themselves out. The other interesting thing is not only was he healed, what did he do right away? He followed Jesus. 
We don't know the details, but the assumption is he followed Jesus for the rest of not only Jesus' life and death and resurrection. He followed Jesus after he ascended and was part of the early church. His commitment stuck. He wasn't just there for the miracle. Yes, it restored him. Yes, it gave him new hope, new perspective, a new, a new sense of purpose in his life. But he also remembered who gave it to him in the first place. It wasn't just about his wanting to see that made it all happen. It was Jesus having mercy on him, God's grace going before him that changed his whole life, his whole outlook, and he followed. I've seen a lot of people pray a lot of desperate prayers, and sometimes God really does come through and does some amazing things. And I watch people go, thanks, and they're gone. There's no staying power. The crowds, we don't read about the crowds following after that, but we read about Bartimaeus following. Jesus isn't always a popular guy. Sometimes, yeah, he says some things that feel good, but other times he says some really hard things, and you have to decide, am I going to follow this guy? Do I believe, do I trust enough to risk that kind of risk? But for Bartimaeus, it changed the entire trajectory of his life. That one act, that one moment of decision where he was willing to make that kind of ask. I want to come back around to something I said a little bit ago. Leaning into God's grace probably is the easiest. It's not easy. <laughs> it's easiest when you have nothing left to lose. It's going to cost you something. And in our age, of, in this community, I think, uh, hopefully not stepping on too many toes, relative affluence, we pay our bills, we can get around, we, you know. The idea of having nothing left to lose feels very desperate. And I'm not wishing for the bottom to come out from underneath your feet. I just know that given enough time, it probably has or will in some form or fashion. Financially, relationally, spiritually, health-wise, whatever. You're going to get the rug yanked out. Life just has a way of doing that. And when it happens, I wonder where you're going to turn. May I invite you, if you never have, to place your faith in Jesus. It's very simple. It's as simple as a prayer. Lord, I have messed up. I am stuck. And I recognize in this moment that only you can save me, that you can forgive me, that you can make me new, that you love me and you sacrificed everything so that I would know that and receive it freely. And I want to allow that act of goodness and mercy and grace to change me from the inside out. Thank you, God, for saving me. If you have prayed that prayer or something like it, I want to give you some fantastic assurance. You are saved. You are born again. Now, did everything else outside of the walls of this place change in your life? Did you suddenly get a million dollars dropped into your account? Probably not. That, that pain that you've had to deal with, for did that fix itself? Maybe not. Is something in you different, though? Yes, it most certainly is. If you have been working on that, maybe, maybe salvation is something that you have lived with, but, but nobody knows it. You're just sitting on the side of the road still. Jesus wants to invite you to get up and follow. I think baptism next week is a perfect way to do that. Give, give some evidence to it. Let some people know. We're not up here to embarrass anybody. We want to support you. We want to encourage you in that commitment. We're in this together. There, there's no lone rangers. We want to support each other in all of that. Just putting that out there. It's because you, this is something tangible you can take action on. Not that busyness makes you more Christian than another person. The act of believing by faith puts you in that camp. But faith can have some evidence to it. It can have hands and feet. But it's going to be risky. You might have to explain some things to your family, to a spouse, coworker. But what's going on with you? You have an opportunity to tell them what God's doing in your life. I want to invite you as we close, we're going to look at four questions, 
Four questions I want you to consider, really think about for yourself. First one is this. What, what is it that you want God to do for you? If you're really honest, what do you want him to do for you? Is it fixing a relationship? Is it getting out of an addiction? Is it some kind of hope financially, physically, psychologically? What, what do you want God to do for you? And the second question is this. What's in the way? Is it, is it shame, a public perception? You know, oh, I can't have people know that I deal with depression and anxiety. What would they say? I can't let people know that I've been hiding this secret sin for so long. What would they say? I can't let people know that, that this perfect family life isn't all perfect. What would people say? What's in the way? Ask it. Get honest. And then third thing is this. What's your next step? What are you going to do? Are you just going to sit by the road and let everybody else tell you who you are, what you should do, keep you in your place? Are you going to do something different? Are you going to take a risk? And then fourth, what's it worth? What's it worth? Is it possible that God could do what God loves to do, and that is be there for you and heal you and save you and invite you into an amazing new life with him? I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing about that. It's not always so rational. Sometimes it's like this tidal wave that comes at us. And if you're experiencing God's love for the first time in this way, I want to celebrate that with you. As we sing, I can invite you to text Jesus to the number up on the screen. If you're making that decision for the first time, we'll give you some traction, some next steps, and some videos that we want to text you this week. But right now, we want to sing and to celebrate God's love that comes at us in such amazing ways. Let's sing.